This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. If you can't beat them, sell through them. Sears will team up with Amazon to sell some of its appliances. Sears stock soars, but some rivals lose billions in market value on the news. Cloud9, Microsoft's cloud business is growing fast, proving to investors that its new strategies are paying off. High fever. Banks are charging more and more for routine products and services. Beware, the fees fatten their bottom line, but trim yours. Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, July 20th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Alexa, turn on my washer. Well, in a first, Sears will sell some large Kenmore appliances, like stoves, refrigerators, and more, outside of its own stores on, you guessed it, Amazon. It will also sell some of its smart appliances that will respond to voice commands through Amazon's Alexa or Echo device. The groundbreaking deal is a gamble. It might sap Sears store traffic, but it could inject new life into the company's century-old Kenmore brand. Sears appliance sales fell nearly 10% last year to just under $4 billion. Now, the deal sparked a rally in shares of the iconic but beleaguered department store. Sears stock up 10%, but it also knocked the wind out of other companies that sell appliances like Home Depot, Lowe's, and Whirlpool. Courtney Reagan has more. It's already been an active year for Sears. Most of it hasn't been good, but today's announcement that the 124-year-old retailer will begin selling its Kenmore products on Amazon.com sent Sears stock soaring. Sears says it's also integrating Amazon's Alexa smart assistant into Kenmore smart appliances. So consumers can simply say, Alexa, turn off the air conditioner. Sears Home Services will still deliver service and install Kenmore products bought on Amazon.com. In a blog post, Sears CEO and largest shareholder Eddie Lampert says, quote, this is exactly the kind of innovative collaboration we strive for at Sears, adding the retailer will look for for other innovative ways to expand the reach of its brands. It is one positive headline after a year of fighting to stay afloat. In March, Sears acknowledged its financial results indicate substantial doubt it would survive on its own. At the time, Chief Financial Officer Jason Holler said the retailer was taking steps to mitigate the risk of failure. A month later, he left the company the second CFO in six months to do so. Around the same time, Sears sold its Craftsman brand to Stanley Black & Decker for nearly a billion dollars. After the sale, the retailer got into a public tussle with the Chinese manufacturer of Craftsman tools when it threatened to break its contract with Sears because of worries about the department store's ability to pay for the merchandise. Eventually, it was resolved. Since January, the retailer has announced the closure of 260 Sears and Kmart stores. It's cut hundreds of jobs and consolidated its corporate structure to lower expenses, trying to offset some of the pain from a 20% sales drop. Most retail experts say a bankruptcy is inevitable, but as these moves show, Sears is doing everything it can to prove them wrong. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Courtney Reagan. Late today, two Dow components released their earnings, Microsoft and Visa. We start with Microsoft. The legacy tech company saw its quarterly profit more than double, helped by growth in its cloud business, and the results come amid a global reorganization. The company earned 98 cents a share, easily topping Wall Street estimates. Revenue was also better than expected and rose from a year ago. The stock, which is at an all-time high, extended its gains initially in after-hours trading. Josh Lipton takes a look at Microsoft's quarter. Microsoft topping $18.9 billion in annual revenue from its cloud business. Kirk Matern of Evercore ISI, who covers the company, says that is the key number in this report. That's up from $15.2 billion in the prior quarter. Gross margins for that business also expanding. Under CEO Satya Nadella, the software giant has pivoted into a true formidable player in the fast-growing cloud computing market with a stock at all-time highs. Matern says investors who are committing capital at these levels are signing off on accelerating earnings growth, which will be driven by that cloud business. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Josh Lipton. 
And here to discuss Microsoft's latest quarter and what may lie ahead for the software giant is Alex Zukin. He's the managing director and senior research analyst at Piper Jaffray. Alex, welcome. Good to have you with us. Uh, to all appearances, this looks like a very good quarter. If I own Microsoft, do I want to buy more here? Yeah, I think I think it is. And, and look, I, I think this is the third really good quarter in a row. And it's important to realize that you know, Satya has really done a great job turning the battleship and making this business, this cloud business, into a leading business for the company. And he's done it now, uh, really, while at the same time being able to expand margins. So, you know, what we're looking for uh, on the on the earnings uh, 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 report is what, what what kind of investments are they going to be making next year, and how do we how do they take advantage and press their advantage? Uh, in this market because I think that their scale and their ability to empathize with large and large customers uh, mm -hmm. is something that sets them apart from a lot of their competitors. Is there anything in their business model that you see right now that might be viewed as a weakness? I think that for a long time investors have wondered if the legacy businesses, the server business, the OS business was going to be something that derails this cloud transition story. But Microsoft has done a good job in recasting those businesses. They've turned you know, on-premise uh, components into hybrid cloud, into edge computing. And so I think, right, I, I, you know, from our glance at the results, we didn't see any weakness in the current results. Last quarter, they saw some weakness in the surface business, in the hardware business, but that you know, rebounded this quarter. Um, so we're, we're not seeing any, any major points of weakness. It's more of a question of you know, how much of the earnings growth story do we see next year uh, as they invest uh, to press this advantage. It seems like it was two areas that really came through for them. One was the cloud, which you talked about there, notably Azure, though they don't break out the numbers there. And the other was the Office 360 or 365, which is the online version of their productivity suite. Tell me about that. That's the, the product that lots of us had on our desktops years ago, but now is migrated to the cloud. That's exactly right. And the important part there is you're not only seeing company, you're not, companies and customers go onto the cloud product, but you're also seeing Microsoft being able to uh, sell a higher price SKU. So uh, Office typically is sold in, in packages. And so when you go from an E1 SKU to an E3 SKU, uh, Microsoft is able to you know, get more, more dollars out of each customer while delivering more value. So it's more about, uh, it's becoming more about how do they migrate customers across these SKUs get more value out of them. And we think that, again, this is another story that's it's, it's playing out, uh, but it's still relatively early. And both of these stories are pushing uh, both growth, but in the office case, what's more important here, in my opinion, uh, is the margin story. They're getting better margins mm -hmm. uh, at the same time. Very quickly, very quickly, are you surprised they've been able to do as well as they have? Stock is an all-time high. You know, I, I think... We underestimate what, what some companies can do right. uh, in, in the long term, and we, we overestimate what they can do in the short term. I think Microsoft is an example of a company where they're at the right place with the right time, with the right product, with right. the right culture. You've seen them reorganize their sales force now. We think that's all about delivering on a solution. Uh, it's about how do you okay. stop selling efficiency to how do you start selling growth and better products. And, uh, I think that's that's where they're going. Have to leave it there. Alex Zukin with Piper Jaffrey. Thanks. And now to Dow Component Visa, which people seem to be using more often these days. The payments processor reported a sharp rise in revenue driven by a higher number of transactions. And like most payment networks, Visa makes a lot of its money from transaction fees. The company topped earnings and revenue estimates in the most current quarter. It also raised its profit and revenue forecast for the year. Shares initially rose in after-hours trading. Deirdre Bosa is covering the story for us tonight. Visa continues to do all the right things by investors. It's growing its payment volumes, helped by its Costco and USAA partnerships and rising consumer spending here in the U.S. It is also aggressively pursuing digital payments and trying to expand its reach into Europe. Just this week, the payments processor expanding its partnership with PayPal to offer debit cards in Europe. Now, Visa is one of the best performing Dow components this year, and it expects a solid second half of the year as well raising its full-year financial targets. For Nightly Business Report, Deirdre Boza, San Francisco. On Wall Street, the Nasdaq rose for the 10th straight day. It wasn't a big game, but it was enough to eke out its first 10-day win streak since 2015. 
While the Nasdaq and the Russell 2000 rose to fresh records, the Dow and the S&P 500 pulled back just a bit from theirs. The blue chip Dow fell nearly 29 to 21,611. Nasdaq added about five points. The S&P 500 fell less than a point. As for the price of crude, it retreated after hitting a seven-week high. And the price of crude isn't where many had expected it to be. That could spell trouble for the energy sector when it starts reporting earnings next week. And as Jackie DeAngelis tells us, the largest risk to earnings equation is energy. Next week is the week for energy company earnings, and these reports will be important because the S&P 500 energy sector is down double digits so far this year. For the markets to march higher, this sector needs a boost. The second quarter average price for Brent was about 8% higher than a year ago. That, in theory, should bode well for the group. But when you take into account the most recent drop in oil prices, companies could run into trouble. That recent price drop caused estimates for energy companies to be cut. With estimates already low, a weak report could be especially problematic for shareholders. I think if they come in worse than expected, I think a new downtrend will ensue in the big names of the big integrators. And, and I think we could explore some room to the downside. We'll hear from Halliburton and Anadarko on Monday, Hess on Wednesday, ConocoPhillips, Shell, Marathon, Petroleum on Thursday. Then we finish the week on Friday with Exxon and Chevron. While analysts are cautious, there's also a glimmer of hope that we could see some positive surprises. The price drop to the $45 level, while not ideal, isn't a danger zone for many companies as long as they continue to manage costs effectively. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jackie DeAngelis. ExxonMobil was fined $2 million by the Treasury Department for reckless disregard of U.S. sanctions in dealings with Russia in 2014. That was when Secretary of State Rex Tillerson was Exxon's CEO. In a statement on his website, the Treasury says Exxon signed eight documents with the head of the state-run Rosneft just weeks after sanctions were imposed on Moscow for annexing Ukraine's Crimea region. Exxon called that decision unfair and sued the government in an effort to overturn the fine. Still ahead, how one company wants to make older, dumb cars a little smarter. A trio of regional banks reported earnings today, and they all had a few things in common. Bank of New York Mellon, Key Corp, and BB&T all posted better than expected revenue, and all three cited an increase in fees. This falls in line with a segment we brought you last night about how a number of different industries are getting a growing percentage of their revenue from those fees. Tonight, Bob Pisani looks specifically at what the banks are doing. Banks have been reporting earnings, and one item not getting enough attention is a rapidly growing line item called non-interest income. That's a boring word for fees that banks charge their customers, both businesses and consumers. It's a business that's growing like mad. For some large regional banks, it's already close to 40 percent of their income. Now, some growth in fee revenues may stem simply from the fact that the customer accounts are growing. But banks have been pushing up what they charge for these fees for years now. They come in all shapes and sizes, but consumers get hit with dozens of them. Transaction fees and insufficient fund fees and inactivity fees and credit card fees. The list goes on and on. Let's look at two of the most typical fees. First, overdraft fees. Bankrate.com says the average overdraft fee for a checking account was $33.04 in 2016, about flat from 2015, but before that it had been going up for 17 straight years. That adds up to big profits for the banks. J.P. Morgan made nearly $2 billion from overdraft charges last year. Wells Fargo made a little less than that. This despite the fact that by law, bank customers must choose to opt into ATM overdrafts. And then there's ATM fees. These fees are particularly high if you're taking money out of a bank that's not your own or out of your own network. Bankrate.com found that last year, the average withdrawal fee for a non-customer bank 
was almost three dollars. Your own bank charged an average of a dollar sixty-seven more. On top of that, a two percent increase from 2015. Some, of course, get those fees waived, but you get the idea. This can get very expensive. Is there any limit to how high these fees can go? There doesn't appear to be. Despite the existence of the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, there is no regulatory limit on what banks can charge for service fees on deposit accounts. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. And as we've been reporting, a new rule from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that Bob just referenced forces financial firms to write arbitration clauses in ways that would make it easier for consumers to bring class action lawsuits against banks. Today, House and Senate lawmakers introduced companion measures to repeal the recently issued arbitration rule, which we've been telling you about. The chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, who is also a vocal opponent of the CFPB, called the rule anti-consumer. The Speaker of the House today said that the Trump administration and Republican leaders in Congress are nearing consensus on tax reform. Speaking at a factory in Massachusetts, Paul Ryan said the possibility of a low corporate tax rate is very possible. Our tax writers are running their numbers to look at how can we get these rates as low as possible, and there are various ways of doing it, and that's the kind of analysis that the tax writing committees, Ways, Means, and Finance are doing. So I believe we can get our rates down low. We have to make the decisions on the trade-offs that get you there, and that's the decisions that will be made ultimately by the tax writing committees, Ways, Means, and Finance. He added that the Republican Party is more united on tax reform than it is on issues like health care. On the same day that the speaker toured that factory, we learned that manufacturing growth in the Philadelphia region in July slowed to the lowest level of the year. Many of the components of the Philadelphia Federal Reserve's index showed growth, but they fell from June's levels. Bad weather cut into the profit at Travelers. That's where we begin tonight's market focus. The property and casualty insurer said its weaker than expected earnings were largely due to significant tornado and hail activity, but revenue rose and it beat expectations. Shares of the Dow component fell 1.5% to 124.57. The railroad operator Union Pacific said rising cargo volumes and higher fuel surcharges helped that company grow profit and revenue. The results topped analyst expectations. We had a very good second quarter. 5% uh, volume growth is always a good thing for a railroad to leverage. Uh, we also generated excellent productivity, about $110 million. And we saw that growth, uh, it was concentrated in coal and in frac sand. But uh, there were other markets that were relatively strong as well, and grain and some others. Shares were off more than 1% to 106.14. The tobacco giant Philip Morris cut its forecast for the year after reporting lower cigarette shipments in the latest quarter. Revenue grew, but not at the clip that analysts were expecting, and profit also came in light. Philip Morris down $1.76 to 119.86. And the snowmobile and ATV maker Polaris sales rose as that company said there was strong demand in its international markets. Those results, along with profit, were better than expected. The company's CEO was pleased with the results. Overall, it was a really good quarter for us. Sales were up 20 percent. Uh, organic sales up seven. So really nice to get back to, uh, to growth in the business. Really, the, the entire Polaris team executed well. Our international business was up 12 percent. Our side-by-side, -side, which is our largest segment, uh, got back to growth after being down uh, six quarters in a row. Wall Street liked it. Shares ended the day up 4 percent to 96.43. Growing demand for software subscriptions to stop cyber threats helped Checkpoint's bottom line, which came in better than expected and was up from last year. Despite the rise in subscriptions, Checkpoint, which is Israel's biggest technology company, said it is seeking seeing some weakness in higher-end deals that pressured shares they fell 7% to 107.41. Scholastic has a plan to increase earnings. The global children's publishing company plans to focus on cost cutting and will use data analytics to guide marketing and sales decisions. In its most recent quarter, the company reported a rise in both earnings and operating income, uh, but it also warned investors that earnings could drop next year due to the absence of new Harry Potter books. The stock fell 1% to $43.99. And quarterly sales of Sarepta's drug for Duchenne muscular dystrophy were much stronger than expected.
That prompted the drug maker to raise its full year revenue guidance late yesterday. The drug, which you may recall was controversially approved by the FDA last year, despite a negative recommendation from a panel of outside advisors. Reaction today was strong. Shares of Sarepta soared 20% to 4093. And after the bell today, the e-commerce giant eBay said higher costs caused profit to plunge. Those results still managed to match analysts' expectations. Revenue edged higher, and the company said it would launch a $3 billion share buyback program. That news, though, wasn't enough. Shares initially fell in after-hours trading, but they ended the regular day up a fraction at 37.18. While the automakers are racing to build smarter cars and trucks with the latest technology, there's another race for millions of other vehicles. Tech companies are developing new devices and apps to connect older models and make them smart. Phil LeBeau has our story. The numbers are daunting. There are more than 271 million vehicles in the U.S. The average car or truck almost 12 years old. They may still run like a top, but most of these older models were built before connectivity took off. So monitoring their performance or if they need maintenance is a challenge. Autobrain is trying to change that. Consumers plug the device into the diagnostic port under the steering wheel of their car or truck, load an app on their smartphone, and then for a monthly fee, they can track where their car is located or how it's driving. Knowing the behavior and understanding what customers want, we could drive them back to the retailer. For example, if we know when a, when, when a car hits 10,000 miles and needs that oil change, we could offer them a discount on an oil change. Or if, uh, their if their tires need to be changed, we could offer them a discount on that as well. For years, automakers and tech companies have talked about cashing in on connected cars. And while some services like GM's OnStar have developed a sizable customer base, the auto industry has yet to figure out how to drive big profits from smarter cars once they leave the showroom and are out on the road. Meanwhile, there are millions of older, so-called dumb cars or trucks, logging mile after mile, an untapped market with enormous potential. Autobrain is not alone in offering a device offering real-time monitoring of cars and trucks. Verizon, for example, has a similar device. And for some time, insurance companies like Progressive have offered ways for you to monitor how your vehicle is performing on the road. All part of the effort to get a better sense of what's happening on America's roads. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Chicago. Coming up, OJ is making headlines again, and there's still a lot of money circling around his name. O.J. Simpson will soon be a free man. This after the Nevada Parole Board unanimously granted his release after nine years in prison for robbery, assault, and other felonies. Simpson, even now one of the most polarizing figures in America, can still attract an audience, evidenced by today's wall-to-wall -to -wall cable coverage of his parole hearing. And Hollywood last year profited from two award-winning television shows about the Simpson saga. So what's next for a man who may have paid his debt to society in one case, but still owes millions in a wrongful death civil judgment in the murders of his ex-wife and a companion? Jane Wells has more from Lovelock, Nevada. You are Orenthal James Simpson? Uh, correct. O.J. Simpson learned today he will be a free man as soon as October. Convincing a Nevada parole board he deserved early release nine years after going to prison for an armed robbery in Las Vegas to retrieve his own memorabilia. I'm no danger to pull a gun on anybody. <laughs> you know, I never have in my life. I've never been accused of it in my life. Uh, nobody's ever accused me of pulling any weapon on them. Even one of his victims came to his defense. This is a good man. He made a mistake. Simpson will leave prison to find an America where the O.J. saga is once again big business. I have O.J. in the car. He's got a gun to his head. FX's The People vs. O.J. Simpson won an Emmy last year, 
followed by an Oscar for ESPN's highly successful O.J. Made in America documentary. Both reignited interest in his story, and so the media descended on the small town of Lovelock in northern Nevada, where the prison is located, selling out the handful of hotels. It gives us an opportunity to, to promote our town uh, and, and make people realize that there are small towns like this all across the country, really, and there's there's a reason to get off the freeway. We have these fabulous love locks here and they, they put them on our love lock plaza, but we've been told that we should do OJ's picture on the back with love locked on it or free the juice. Simpson will leave prison a wealthy man. He has pensions from his production company, the NFL and the Screen Actors Guild, totaling over $4 million, money that is protected by law from going towards the millions of dollars he owes in a civil judgment to the families of Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson. But any money he might try to make on the outside would have to go to that judgment if the families can find it. For example, Simpson has said he now possesses the memorabilia he was trying to take by force in Las Vegas, potentially including the suit he wore the day he was acquitted of murder. That is the sort of valuable the Goldmans and Browns could take. And ironically, when O.J. Simpson walks out of Lovelock Prison October 1st, I do vote to grant parole when eligible. It will be one day before the 22nd anniversary of a jury deciding he was not guilty of killing two people, a crime for which no one has ever gone to prison. For Nightly Business Report, Jane Wells, Lovelock, Nevada. If Simpson tries to earn money once he's released and attempts to hide it from the Brown and Goldman families illegally, that could potentially be a violation of his parole, which could land him back in prison. That is Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for me as well. I'm Tyler Matheson. Have a great evening, everyone, and we'll see you tomorrow.